Uh, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and fantastic to see, fantastic to see so many of you up and early and excited for another day of space. Um, we had a fantastic session yesterday. I think today will be even more interesting if that's possible. Um, it's my pleasure to invite Paul Scully Power to the lectern to to introduce uh, our speaker this morning. Um, Paul Scully Power, as you know. Uh, a pioneer of Australian space, an SIAA life member, uh, and an absolute asset to our organisation. Please welcome Paul. Well, we're starting off with a bang, I guess. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the Honourable Melissa Price the Minister for Defence Industry and also the Minister for Science and Technology. Added to that, Minister, you're also responsible for space and the space industry, which might be your biggest responsibility yet, as the space industry is undergoing the biggest revolution it's ever seen, and it will impact every business and every company in Australia let alone defence and national security. And why do I say that? Think about it. Just five years ago, there were only 1,419 satellites in operation in orbit. Today, there are 3,000... Sorry, 4,550 satellites operational, of which over 80% are in low Earth orbit, and that's very important. And five years from now, there will be over 100,000 satellites in orbit. And that is going to provide something absolutely unique, and I call it the space internet. It's going to be 100... You can do the calculations. It's going to be 100 times more powerful than the current internet. It will reach everybody on Earth... And just think about what the current internet has done for us and how it's revolutionised our lives. This is going to be a revolution on steroids. Minister, you're also the member for Durack in Western Australia. It's the largest electorate in Australia. It covers 1.6 million square kilometres. And you might go ask, how big is that? Let me tell you, it's the size of France... Germany, Italy, the UK and Ireland all wrapped up together. So, Minister, having responsibility for the largest electorate in Australia, it's now matched with your responsibility for probably what's going to have the largest impact on industry and defence that this country has ever seen. What a huge remit to, provide, to preside over the biggest revolution in our lifetime. And for this audience, the first cab off the rank is JP9102. For those who don't know, it's the current tender for Defence Satellites Communication System. And $3 billion have been committed to that. I just hope, Minister, that JP9102 is being considered in the light of what I've just said. Because the space internet is going to change economic ac access to space, it's going to provide system resilience, it's going to provide ultra-low latency, and I've done the calculation, that the latency will be reduced by a factor of 36. That has incredible impact on defence. And also... it offers the opportunity of very broadband optical communications. So, Minister, we look forward this morning for your most graceful presence. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And good morning, everybody. Good to see some familiar faces in the audience. 
Move that pen out of the way. So, many thanks. Thanks for the invitation to be here today. Can I acknowledge uh, the Chair of the Space Industry Association of Australia, Dr Tim Parsons, CEO James Brown, Chair of the Australian Space Agency Advisory Board, Dr Megan Clark, Head of the Australian Space Agency, Mr Enrico Palermo, Space Industry Leaders, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. It is really my great pleasure to address this year's Southern Space Symposium and I truly thank the Space Industry Association of Australia for the opportunity. Well, isn't this wonderful to see people face to face? <laughs> How refreshing. If I have to record one more video, <laughs> honestly, it's getting to be like three a day. But I think what, ha what used to happen is but you would say, I'm sorry I can't come to that event. I mean, I'm from Western Australia, you've got that right, so there's a few restrictions about where I can go and, you know, you never know what, from one day to the next what the restrictions are going to be. But it used to be, oh, I can't come, and people go, OK, well, that's very sorry. Now they say, oh, but you can do a video. <laughs> we have created a monster. <laughs> um, so it goes without saying that COVID has been a defining feature of our lives for nearly two years but I think Australia is slowly starting to turn the corner, although the Omicron COVID variant is a reminder that normality post-COVID may still be a way off. Today I'd like to speak to you about the work that we have done to advance the government's plan to grow Australia's space industry. I will do a little bit of stock taking, looking at where we are and where we're going. Of course, we're going to the moon. Um, but with space, I think the audience in this room know that the sky is the limit. This is my first speech to the space sector since the Prime Minister entrusted me with the added portfolio responsibility of science and technology and, by extension, the Australian Space Agency. I am incredibly honoured to be the number one, but not the only, advocate in Cabinet. I know that the strong connection between the civil space industry the defence industry and science and technology is not lost on any of us. Over the past three years, I've had the opportunity to engage with those of you that have been working on defence programs. And I know how passionate you are with the space sector, and I'm not surprised that it is growing quickly. Powered by inventive, world-class businesses and researchers right across the nation, many of them based in my home state, of Western Australia. So I come to this role from a state with an active space industry and a proud, a proud history, I should say, dating back to a time when Australia was considered a leading space-faring nation. WA has over 70 companies delivering space and space-related services, a highly skilled space workforce and hosts a broad range of space facilities and also institutions. And you may already know this, but our, our head of the Australian Space Agency, Enrico Palermo, also has a connection to Western Australia because he is a product of the University of Western Australia, which we're incredibly proud of. And as you've just heard, my electorate, uh, which is a very large electorate, um, it, it also has been central to many of the world's space efforts over the years. And Jurek is perhaps better known for the wealth that we dig out of the ground, the iron ore and the gold, um, rather than the communication signals we used to send into space. Carnarvon in WA's northwest once hosted the largest tracking station outside of North America and provided the go, no go confirmation that sent the Apollo 11 mission spacecraft out of Earth orbit and on its way to the moon. I was just a little girl in kindy, probably that very annoying little sister, I'm the youngest of four, in my hometown of, of Kalgoorlie. But memories of the euphoria around the first moon landing still remain. More than half a century later, space still excites our imagination. As Australia enters a new space era, we have an excellent opportunity across the nation, from Darwin to the ACT to Tassie, to work together to build our national space capability and inspire young Australians to turn that imagination into rewarding space careers. And I'm very pleased that we're making the most of that opportunity. 
The government's strong leadership, backed by more than $800 million of investment to date, is helping to transform and grow Australia's space sector. The government has a vision to build an Australian space sector that lifts the broader economy and improves the lives of Australians. But there's more that we can do to maximise the opportunities emerging from what is shaping to be one of the world's biggest and fast in growing high-tech sectors. And to capture a significant share of the growing value now worth some 450 billion US dollars. I am determined to work with all stakeholders to advance the goal set by the government for Australia's space sector, and that is to triple the size of the sector by 2030, adding $12 billion to the economy and creating up to 20,000 new high-skilled jobs. It is incredibly ambitious, but I think it's an incredibly achievable goal as well. Competition in the global space sector is fierce, but with our focus efforts to leverage Australia's competitive advantage, we will succeed. And we're making good progress in the past four years. We've built a strong foundation from which the sector has lifted off with the Australian Space Agency leading the charge. Since the agency was established, over $2.5 billion in investment has flowed into the sector from government, the private sector, and also from international space agencies. And we're not relenting in our efforts. Even a once in a lifetime, once in a century global pandemic can't hold us back. In the face of the crisis, the government has maintained its focus on supporting the sector to grow by investing in building capability, strengthening partnerships and inspiring the next generation of Aussie space workers. A key focus of the government is to support Australian businesses to get their products into space. At the height of COVID last year, we injected $11 million into 10 projects to boost jobs and skills in the sector and to contribute to the broader economy. These projects, funded through the government's $15 million International Space Investment Initiative, included R&D activities to improve GPS technology, build an AI space crew to help astronauts with complex system tests and design cutting edge spacesuits that will make spacewalking easier. An early prototype of these spacesuits was developed by Australian space services company, Human Aerospace. It was tested on the International Space Station in, in 2015, attesting to how Australian innovation is held in high regard. Our investment in these projects has helped build relationships with international space agencies while boosting our domestic space capability and our economy. Also in the course of last year, construction of Australia's first mission control centre at the Australian Space Agency headquarters in Adelaide kicked off. This state-of-the-art centre is now up and running and a focal point for space businesses and researchers, providing them with, with facilities to control satellite and space missions. It was made possible by $16 million by the Morrison government funding um, for a local company, Sabre Astronautics, and $2 million from the South Australian government. The centre is one of seven infrastructure projects awarded grants from our 19.5 million dollar National Space Infrastructure Fund fund to speed up the sector's growth. Also awarded a grant with, worth, worth more than 2.5 million is a National Space Qualification Network. This network is led by the ANU and will offer end-to-end -end payload testing services to Australian manufacturers, meaning that they would no longer have to send sensitive equipment offshore for testing no doubt saving time and money. And we have kept alive our aspiration to go to the Moon and Mars, and of course this is going to be a key priority for me going forward. In an exciting development last month, and it was almost like the first day on the job, so I did feel a bit of a fraud, um, you no doubt saw that the government reached an agreement with NASA for a small Australian-made rover to be included in a future mission. The agreement will enable leading Australian businesses and researchers to come together to develop the rover, backed by $50 million in funding from the Trailblazer program under the government's $150 million Moon to Mars initiative. I've no doubt that the Aussie rover, or Red Dog, which is just my working title for now, actually the full title is Red Dog the Pilbara Wanderer, just in case you're <laughs> coming to a place near you. <laughs> uh, just, just my working title, but I have no doubt 
that the rover and the project um, is going to inspire the next generation of scientists, entrepreneurs and researchers. To gain a foothold in the lucrative space market is not easy. I expect there's many people in this room that would agree with me. So to succeed, you, you need to have something to show for it. Your products must have space experience or space heritage, as we would call it in this room. And that's why the demonstrator program is going to be so important. Earlier this year, our demonstrator program supported 20 projects with grants of up to $200,000 to test their feasibility. Today, I'm announcing details of round two of the program. Australian companies will be able to access support of between $750,000 and $10 million to help launch their te technology into space. Companies will need to contribute at least 25% of the mission's costs. To apply for a mission grant in round two, companies do not have to have been a recipient from round one, but will need a feasibility study to support their application. And that's why we're announcing the guidelines now so that we give companies the opportunity to do the work before applications open in the first quarter of next year. Our aim is to get 10 to 15 companies and researchers into space through this program so that they can build the heritage they need to make potential sales. Now turning to space in the defence portfolio. As you are all likely aware, the 2020 Defence Strategic Upline, uh, sorry, put the teeth back in, the 2020 Defence Strategic Update outlined that access to space is critical to the ADF warfighting effectiveness, situational awareness and the delivery of real-time communications. In the four structure plan, space is now a new defence domain and we've outlined our $7 billion investment in space capabilities over the next decade, including investment in sovereign controlled satellites. This will transform the way the ADF operates in space and the broader joint force. And I'm sure many of you will be aware of the joint project 9102, which Paul referred to, which is focused on modernising defence's satellite communications. You may have also have been tracking my announcement earlier this year that space will be added to the list of defence's sovereign industrial capability priorities, which I think shows just how significant space is um, to the defence more broadly. Australia has entered a new era of space activity, driven by Aussie creativity in space entrepreneurship and research. With the full backing of the Morrison government, the space sector in Australia is soaring to new heights, all the way to the moon and beyond. But we also have our sights set on earthly benefits. We're making sure our space endeavours provide economic opportunities, jobs and prosperity for Australia. Australian space historian Kerry Doherty, who now happens to work for our space agency, recalls to mind Australia's early space activities in the 1960s that gained us a place in what she calls the Space Club. The government will continue to provide strong leadership to build the capability and partnerships we need to regain our pride of place in that club. I'd like to thank the Space Industry Association for being a strong national voice for this sector. For those who've already crossed paths with me in the defence industry portfolio, you will know that I don't take a backward step when it comes to supporting a growing industry. I have systematically gone about identifying what the barriers are for our Aussie SMEs to enter the defence industry supply chain and at the same time, we're making sure we've got real enablers to make this happen. In the space industry, and as the Minister responsible for space, I'm determined to make life easier for you, not more difficult. I want to support your innovative ideas and commercial endeavours. I know you want more certainty, and you want to know where to invest, and for the government to invest as well. You also want government to be more strategic. It's not enough for government to document our desire to grow the industry. You want action, and that's what you'll get from me. Thank you so much for your attention today.
Uh, Minister, thank you for a stirring call to action for both the government and this industry. And I think I can speak on behalf of everyone in this room when I say thank you for giving us some advance notice of a grant application round and not putting the deadline just after Christmas. That's fantastic. <laughs> I did note a few people writing a few notes down, so I, I, I tried my best to touch all those points of bits of information you might need to know today. Fantastic. Now, I know you've got to run back to Parliament House, but you've kindly agreed to do uh, one special thing for us. Um, we've been holding on to a life membership award for one of our members uh, since the start of the pandemic, and we thought we'd take this opportunity to present it today. Um, we have 11 life members of the Space Industry Association of Australia. It's a recognition of long service to both the industry and our organisation. Um, today, we're recognising Rod Drury. Um, Rod runs the international space business for Lockheed Martin, but more important than that, um, he was the chair of our organisation and on the board for seven years and has given immense service to us. And so, uh, Rod, it's my pleasure to let you know uh, that we didn't break your trophy in the last 18 months, uh, that you have been elected to life membership, and I'd like you to come up on the stage and, and accept your award now. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please uh, join me in thanking the Minister for her excellent speech this morning.